Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is, this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. While there are self-proclaimed pundits who see every election as transformative, guilty as charged, <laughs> the Democratic wins last month nationally and in the state really do signal broad change both in the challenges to President Trump and a stifled progressive agenda in Albany. In Washington, New York Democratic House members are poised to chair a wide array of committees, including appropriations, foreign affairs, small business, and judiciary, where Manhattan's Gerald Nadler will be in the catbird seat over moves to, to, to impeach the president. And Brooklyn's Hakeem Jeffries will be the Democratic caucus chair, putting him in line as a potential speaker as the older, as the older generation of current leaders eventually yield their seats. The Democrats taking solid control of the state Senate means a long list of progressive priorities, enhancing rent protections, ethics reforms, criminal justice reform, legalizing marijuana, equitable school funding, and bringing our voting system into the 21st century. All are there for the taking, assuming legislative leaders and Governor Cuomo mean what they say. There are always clouds on the horizon, especially as major parties' ideological wings have strengthened at the expense of the broad middle. And with at least five New York Democrats potentially eyeing presidential runs, Cuomo, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, former Attorney General Eric Holder, former Mayor Michael Bloomberg, and current Mayor Bill de Blasio, plus former Starbucks Chairman Howard Schultz, who grew up in, in Canarsie's Bayview houses, not too far from East New York's Linden houses where I grew up, it won't be long before the issues agenda gets subsumed by 2020 politics. We're joined by four New Yorkers who closely watch and take part in politics and public affairs to discuss what happened in the elections and what it all means. Gloria Brown Marshall is a professor at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, a syndicated columnist and Supreme Court correspondent who has written extensively on voting rights and attempts at vote suppression, including her book, The Voting Rights War. Tanya Milich is the author of The Republican War on Women, uh, a co-founder of the National Women's Political Caucus, and until a recent party switch, was part of that vanishing breeze of moderates known as Rockefeller Republicans. <laughs> ben Max is the editor-in-chief of, chief of Gotham Gazette, one of the city's premier go-to sites for coverage of civic and political affairs. Joseph Vitteridi is the chair of the Urban Policy and Planning Department at Hunter College, and author most recently of, of The Pragmatist, Bill de Blasio's Quest, to save the soul of New York. Uh, Gloria, I want to start with you a little bit off the news of the day, which is there's a case in North Carolina in which it appears very strong evidence that through shenanigans involving absentee ballots of mainly minority voters, uh, Republicans may be stealing a congressional seat. Maybe stealing a congressional. I'm trying seat. to be reasonable here. In North here. Carolina, as right. opposed to <laughs> Georgia, Florida, blood, Ohio, please. Pennsylvania, and about 50 other states. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, here's here's what's going on. We have this nexus between technology and voting, where the person or the party, I should say, that that gains uh, control of the legislative body, then has the right to decide what the districting lines are going to be. And with technology, they've learned how to fine tune this in a way to gerryman where they want people to be so they know they can pack um, districts with people who are of color, who are usually voting Democratic, not because they just love the Democrats, but usually the Democrats represent their issues. And so with, with this technology, they're able to slice and dice these types of districts, but that's not enough. Then they have to say, well, we're going to cut out early voting. We're going to look at and analyze what are the, what are the ways in which people of African descent who vote Democratic are going to be helped with the process, early voting, Sunday voting, um, other types of registration, and they cut all those things out and then added photo ID requirements, which of course swept the nation of conservatives as this little goody goody bag that was handed to them by the U.S. Supreme Court in June of 2013 with the case of, of Shelby County versus Holder. So there is a lot to unpack when it comes to the ways in which people of color are undermined in this democracy. I want to come back to it because New York is, let's say, somewhat short of the poster child for good voting laws. So I want to, I do want to, I, I do want to come back. The other thing that's in the news as of the day of this taping is George H.W. Bush's funeral. And um, you have seen a lot of the undertone is the, is the difference between um, 
the type of politics that existed between 1989 and 1993 and the kind of politics that we see that we that we see today you you know you were a delegate to republican conventions you've been an active you know an active democrat an active republican for many many years what's with your old party Oh, you, you know what happened in my old party. Uh, I wrote a book called The Republican War Against Women because I was so angry at the treatment of women by the leadership of my party. I uh, was a delegate to the 92 convention in Houston for uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. I watched that funeral today, and while I thought it was a grand and glorious funeral, uh, they didn't treat us very well, us women. And uh, George Bush, Herbert Walker Bush, was one of the worst. This was a man who said he uh, supported a woman's right to choose, and once he became vice president, he turned against us. And us, I'm talking about women. I'm not talking about just uh, people of color, women, but women like me. And a group of us fought for many years to try to get the party to think about treatment of women and uh, uh, treatment of people of color, and nothing happened. Every time we would turn around, and because they're in the news, I must tell you that the two people who were the operatives who gave us the worst time, three of them were Lee Atwater, who is now dead, and their campaign partners, Paul Manafort and Roger Stone. So here we are all these years later, and if you wait long enough, the the wheel turns. Well, the, the, the question <laughs> is whether they're going to be finally, if the wheel is finally going to roll over them. Uh, Joe, it's, um, you, know, you, know, you know, we're talking about changes in the Republican Party. We're talking about challenges to a progressive agenda in Albany. All of a sudden we have, you know, it's not just a 32-31 majority for, for, for Democrats in the state Senate. It's 39 to 30 what is it, 39 to 33, which is like much larger than I think a lot of us. And all of a sudden, this, this progressive agenda that Democrats have been talking about, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. Well, we'll see. Um, it's the moment of truth. For a long time, the, the Democrats, including the governor, have been using the Republicans as an excuse uh, to not do things that they claim they want to do, but they don't really want to do. So now they don't have an excuse. Uh, they have both houses of the uh, of the uh, legislature. Um, everybody, for some reason, well, I, I guess for an obvious reason, wants to consider themselves a progressive. What is a progressive, though? And I, I think the thing that really divides the progressives from moderates in the Democratic Party in New York is issues of economics. It's tax structure. It's, uh, it's support of things like housing. It's, ch it's, it's having voting laws that allow, pe you know, that make it easier for people to vote. It's dealing with the corruption there because you can't separate the corruption from a policy making process that favors, you know, real estate uh, moguls and businesses. Fire. And gives fire, a, and fire, fire. Yeah. Fire the, you know, the city's estate. been on fire for a long time. So um, it remains to be seen. I, I hope to be pleasantly surprised, but. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm really not convinced because, you know, uh, part of the coalition will involve Democrats who are not from the city. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I, I think it's also interesting, I have to say, you know, for a long time that we would teach it. Political science, one, was that talked about, you know, had this vision of, of white cities, black suburbs, uh, black cities, white suburbs. And, and still we're saying, that, you know, the, the big dif factor in the last election was, you know, white women from the suburbs. But what you're really seeing also in the suburbs, if you look at the mi migration patterns, there are more blacks moving to the suburbs than mo moving into the city. At, at least in point. cities like New York where yeah. you have gentrification. And so one of the things that's going on in the suburbs, and, and it's produced a majority leader in the Senate who's a black woman, is... Uh, is your, the blackening of the suburbs. There are more immigrants in the suburbs. There are more uh, Latinos in the suburbs. You know, what used to be the population that flooded New York is now starting to flood the suburbs. So I think it's gonna be very interesting to see how that plays out and how the new, the new suburbs play out in, in the new Democratic Party in Albany. 
Uh, uh, ben, you've been looking at this stuff. Gotham Gazette covers this from all angles. I mean, you know, we've been talking about ethics reform. He's talking about the corruption. They're talking about the need for voting reforms. Um, you're talking to a lot of people. How, is, how does this all play out? Is this a challenge people are ready for, or is it be careful what you wish for because you may mm -hmm. get it? <laughs> it's probably going to be some of both and, and a variety of, of ways in which different issues play out. I think some of what Joe got at is absolutely key is where is all the agreement going to come from exactly? You have an assembly majority, a senate majority, and you have the governor. And if anybody thinks that Governor Cuomo isn't still going to drive the agenda in Albany, they're sorely mistaken. He has the most power. He gets to outline the executive budget in January. His priorities are still going to be the dominant ones. However, there's a big group of new state senators that came in to help make this supermajority that didn't necessarily endorse him, that aren't necessarily aligned with him, are pushing for a bit of a more progressive agenda that actually lines up with what the assembly majority has been passing for years that is not Governor Cuomo's complete agenda. All that being said, there is a significant list of things that they are all going to agree on and probably pass quickly. Voting reform, some type of campaign finance reform, an extension of reproductive rights, more gun control, there's going to be things that they can really push through without, I think, a lot of uh, discrepancy among Democrats. And then things will get a little bit tougher when they hit some, some other issues, like, let's say, rent regulations, I think. But you were talking about the, um, you know, the voting rights issues in other states. And we're the great progressive paragon, right? Oh, no, we're, we're, we're not. <laughs> we are not. We're always at the, we're always at the head of the march, are no, we? No, we're not. Um, that's, <laughs> I think it would be hard to pass that judgment to the people who stood in line for hours yes. to vote. Yes. <laughs> and, um, that was a facetious question. Uh, okay. And that was Bobby like, facetious. Oh, yeah, was that facetious? Or, oh. Well, let's put it this way. In the, at the end of the day, New York has fallen behind. It's fallen behind with the, the voting systems we have in place. We saw the catastrophe that happens when you have a piece of paper that you have to slide into a slot and you have people who mean well, but the poll workers are, you know, in need of, of training. And we need younger, newer people. And I won't say newer meaning younger at that, but newer to the system with the enthusiasm and, and the thought that they want to be a part of the political process. And one way to do that, and I know I did, was to work the polls and get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and sit there and, and, and handle the, the people who are coming through to vote. I mean, we need to actually look at New York as a system that sometimes is somewhat arrogant. I mean, I'm not a, a New Yorker by birth. I did marry a New Yorker, so I feel like I've gone through the change. But the thing that I really <laughs> want to put forward is sometimes New York sits on its laurels. Yes, and it when does. it comes to voting rights, it has done that. I mean, it led, the, it led the campaigns earlier to, to um, have the, the other languages on the ballots, for example. Mm -hmm. those, those initiatives of the 60s and 70s, that came through lawsuits, but they happened. And now they kind of just fell off. And I, I'm really wondering what is happening that we don't have early voting that we don't have the type of automatic registration that other states may have. Voting by mail. Yeah, so, voting yeah. by mail and other mechanisms that would, would make New York um, the leader when it comes to voting rights. Those things are very likely to happen, as I was saying. Same day registration, automatic registration, early voting. Everybody from Governor Cuomo to Andrew Stewart Cousins, Carl Hasey, they're, they're basically saying these are the top of our agenda. We all agree on this. We all, but we should be questioning as they get set to do this, why it hasn't happened before. Yes. Democrats have easily been pointing to Republicans in the Senate, but Governor Cuomo has pushed things through the Republican oh, Senate that, that he's wanted to pass. Mm -hmm. this and these are not an things that he cared about. agreement by both party leaders. It has been to the advantage of the leadership of the Republican and the Democratic Party in the state legislature to keep voting very difficult. We should have had these kinds of things many, many years ago. I went to the University of Colorado. They have mail voting there. I spoke, talked to my brother who lives there. It's easy. What's the matter with New York? The idea that New York is a progressive state on uh, election issues is absolutely wrong. And I think finally, finally, there's enough embarrassment that maybe you're right, Ben. Maybe we will get it this time. But even in a best case scenario, if you do have more, <clears throat> more voting, the question remains what translates into policy. Is it votes or is it money? And, you know, one of the great things that's happened to American politics in the last 
and New York State is a, is a principal example, is a decline in voting. Since John Lindsay ran 65, voting participation has declined by more than 50 percent, about 55, 60 percent, uh, number of people who vote in New York. Um, and lobbying and money plays a key role in determining what policy is. So, so the question is how responsive the political system, the governmental system, is going to be to the vote. I mean, the good news of 2018 is you've seen an extraordinary increase in voting for the first time in many years. But that was really so motivated that bell by what? Trump. That, that, was, really that a, was motivated by Trump. Exactly. Exactly. But will that mean... Will, will, that, will that have staying power mm -hmm. in but, 2020? But here's a, the other thing, going back, I would like to see if you could track the decline in voting with the decline in civics in, in, yes. in our high schools, where we're not even telling young people about their government, how to access their government, what, how the government yeah. is, is structured, it's, it's you know, and, and, and that they could play a role in it. I remember in, in high school where we actually were part of political campaigns, That's where, right. yeah, right. you That's volunteered right. and you passed out pamphlets, you did, you, you know, manned the phones, no, you did has, all these different things. There's been all kinds of studies. That I was on a commission that um, Clinton appointed on civic education in the schools. Bill Galston headed it up. And it's clear that if you look at the curricular in the schools, we don't teach government anymore. We don't teach what is, what, why is it important to participate. Students don't know anything about the three branches of government in high school. I mean, it, 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 you're absolutely correct. It's a very big piece of it. How do, you, how do you acculturate people to the democratic process? Schools is the number one. Place. Well, let me let me, let me also say though yes. we suffer from a, a pretty big lack of competition in New York, and that also points to the fact that the Republican Party in New York has a lot of soul searching to do after losing the state Senate and losing yet another round of statewide seats and not having won a statewide race in a long time, not really putting up great candidates, not having much of a pipeline. You know, there's serious issues around competition. One of the other things that drove turnout is there were more Democratic challenges to Democrats this year right. in That's the true. state Senate and obviously the governor's race and lieutenant governor. So that's interesting when you think about competition. Maybe in New York, the way it's heading, it's not even about the Republican Party. It's That's about it. I, I think that you're so right. It's about, as you pointed out before, the difference between a moderate and a progressive and a conservative Democrat, you know, and within the party and what they represent and what they're bringing to the people, I think. But also, for some reason, and I, maybe it happened with Barack Obama, I, I'm not quite sure, that this whole thing that voting is supposed to be a religious experience, they're just supposed to go <laughs> into the poll and come out new, you know, <laughs> and baptized by democracy. You know? <laughs> and we need to understand and it's a civic duty. That does not mean that you're supposed to have these great overwhelming feelings every time you go in to vote. Not Let after you've stood in line for an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> the religious experience is yeah, I need to go get something. to my job. A closely related issue is not only the voting, you know, how we vote, but who we get to vote for, which is, of course, the issue of redistricting and, and the issue of gerrymandering that, that you brought up. And, you know, we're in a state at least on the legislative level and on the congressional level, um, where politicians are picking their voters instead of voters picking their elected of their right. their mm -hmm. elected but officials. It's been. Um, <laughs> you know, the, now you don't have to cut a deal between the Democrats and the Republicans. <laughs> to, you know, I mean, we have the same 19 million people that you can divide up. That you have a 65 vote majority in the assembly for the Democrats, and you had a one or two vote majority in the state Senate for, for the Republicans. And when you, you talked about how they packed voters into minority, you know, they packed minority voters into districts in order to whiten the districts around them, which is part of how the Republicans took the Congress. You know, Democrats get more votes, but the Republicans win, congrats, you know, win control of mm -hmm. legislative chambers. Minority lawmakers want that. You know, minority lawmakers are complicit in wanting to avoid their own challenges. It's very complicated. It's very complicated, and I, and I question sometimes the Congressional Black Caucus. You know, I have to ask, what are you doing right now? You know, how is it that, you know, we cannot know what you're doing? I get press releases every now and then, but I want to know what's going on. I want to have a sense of what type of potential legislation is going to be harmful to my community. It's going to be harmful to women, harmful to children, harmful to people, my students, people I care about. And I need to know about this before it happens. And I don't want to go out like Fannie Lou Hamer used to say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired and protest in the, the rain and the sleet and the snow.
in order to undo something and repeal a law that look up Fannie Lou Hamer. Look up Fannie Lou Hamer. But if, but if you, the idea that we don't know what our politicians are doing, we, we <laughs> ask them, you know, to come and visit. We do in the, in the communities of color, the African American community. They come on Sunday. They talk to us for a little bit. And then they leave again. They don't even stay long enough yep. to put something in the plate. Right. So, but, yeah. but my my concern is this. What questions are we supposed to be asking? And I ask people, what questions? I want to ask people, do you believe in African-American empowerment? Do you believe in women's equality? I want to ask them this when they're running for office. And they could lie to me before they get in office, but at least I have something on record to go back and say, hey, you lied but about the this But the question topic. is, you raised the question of competition. You know, we're an all, you know, we're an all democratic state, but still how you define what that district is, the, you know, very, very well can determine whether you have a competitive system. So on redistricting, this election is somewhat important that just because happened in New York, right. mm -hmm. but the next one is more important. Because and that's when you will do the redistricting after, after the, the next after census. After the 2020 exactly. election and the 2020 census. And so this goes to the, comp the question of what Democrats will do with power in state government is some of those suburban members who just got elected to the Senate or some that held onto their seats by more narrow margins, they know almost tomorrow in a year and a half is another election for the state legislature and they have to keep those seats to keep that majority to then do the redistricting you know the way they want now there is a new system coming to new york based on a constitutional amendment that was passed in 2014 but there could be adjustments to that before we even get to the census um you want to well you know i still think it goes back to for asking the democrats what do you mean by everybody's a progressive? What do you mean by that? And, and how do you separate the progressives, the real progressives from the moderates? And I still come back to economic issues that they don't like to talk about. I mean, you know, it seemed facetious, crazy when de Blasio says we should have a millionaire's tax. You know what that meant? It meant for somebody who's making $500,000 a year, it would cost about 900 bucks. It's just ridiculous. Is, is, and that's become Absolutely controversial. Absolutely ridiculous. $900 Why? Isn't for, that re for I mean, a, somebody uh, making $500,000 uh -huh. $500, a year spends more than that on a weekend for recreation. Good. I mean, really. It's, and this became an issue that was untouchable. I mean, it, it's a real, it's a real uh, measure of where the conversation is on economic quality but in the, New York that, State. And that, this is New York. That conversation has been particularly focused after the deal between the governor and the mayor and Amazon to try to bring mm -hmm. the you know to try to bring Amazon into uh, Long Island City I have you know even though everybody's throwing around the three billion dollar number the vast majority of which is as of right and they don't get them they don't get that money until they produce the jobs that they've committed to produce I think if they had said off the bat these are performance based um, you know, you know, benefits we're offering, but there's a nexus of power and money and real estate. But, but, but this is what I find confusing. De Blasio um, supports this measure that we voted on to allow communities to have more say in how money is spent. Mm -hmm. But then he's, he has this deal behind closed doors where he, you know, makes a deal with Amazon to move them to um, Long Island City without community input. But it was also the governor. Yeah, I but mean, it was also the governor. It was the governor. Let's not just put it all on the mayor. I, 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 I think I think the way, way it's the irony of it. One at a time. I mean, it's just either way. It's the irony of it that on the one hand, they, it's almost as it's though they know. Pretty expensive irony. Yeah, right. but it's but it's almost like they knew that community input was only going to go so far. That if they wanted something like this, even with community input, that they were going to get it anyway. I, I first of all, I, I think this whole. The deal was really made by the governor. So de Blasio's decision was, do I become a spoiler in this or do I go along with it? And he made it, being the pragmatist that I think he is, um, he made a calculated decision and said, this is probably going to go through anyway. If I kill it, then I've got to deal with all the people who said, look what we lost here, 50,000 jobs. It was a done deal. Even, uh, you know, using ULERP is a function of state policy. What was wrong with it, as I said in an Euler article I wrote land, uh, is the, is in the, the local very good land use review uh, publication called Gotham Gazette a couple of weeks ago, uh, the optics were awful. It was done in secret. You, you have a city where 47% of people are near poverty. 20% are in poverty. And we're giving away $3 billion, what appears to be $3 billion to the richest man in the world. It, 
just the optics of that and the perception of people who are suffering. You're, you're a few blocks away from the largest housing complex Queensboro housing in, in the country, and we know that the housing authority is a disaster. You're down the block from a, a subway system that, that's falling apart, and, and, we, and we're building a private heliport for the sky. To, I mean, the whole thing, what is optics. going on in I mean, there? Don't a, they have PR more people than optics, who work for though. Them? Well, that's part of the really thing. The rollout was terrible. And I think awful. they were expecting to announce this deal and be heralded as the great job creators. They're bringing 25,000 jobs and, and all these opportunities. I think and they, they, they miscalculated. Yeah, they got very, but wound Max, up, what, why? very wound up in the competition. These, these are two, I'm talking about the governor and the mayor, supposedly very smart professional politicians. Why in the world did they have the percep perception that it would just be fine? It has to do partially with the kind of crummy, crummy uh, election system that we hope we're going to get changed because they have been playing this game ever since, well, since 2011, haven't they? I, I, I think this was not totally out of character for the mayor to, to make some of those miscalculations. We've seen quite a bit of that from him. For the governor, I was surprised by it that they didn't have a better rollout. Well, they were it, surprised, I think. Yes. But, but why? Why were they so surprised? Isn't that an interesting I, well, question? I, think, I mean, I huh? think that's for us. That's, that's arrogant, uh, arrogant absolutely. power. I think their it? expectations were off. I think I think. But we also got saw so in a poll today, <laughs> a po the first poll that came out asking New Yorkers about the deal, a vast majority said in yes. Including in Queens. Including in Queens. So <laughs> yes. the in terms of the blowback, you had some very loud elected officials and some very, you know, a well, significant number local. of locals and yeah. and uh, activists, and there's still going to be blowback. And hey, maybe more New Yorkers, including in Queens, will learn more about the details. Maybe it, they just hear 25,000 jobs, opportunity. You know, we like Amazon. Let's do it. L let me just say this about the process, though. This was a game played on Amazon's rules. And Andrew Cuomo was absolutely fine with those rules. I don't know that Bill de Blasio was or would have been in favor of that, but he did have to make a practical decision. This is a behemoth in Amazon that is one force that Governor Cuomo couldn't necessarily, I think, go to toe to toe with and say, we're not playing by these rules. You want to come to New York? But so let's many do of the rules the are as of right. So many of the. Benefits, I'm talking about the right. secretive process yes, yes. to it, right? The you know, NDAs. I mean, because the golden rule is that he who has the gold rules. Well, here's a concern I have. I'm going back to the housing, public housing units there. And there is a concern, people I know in public housing, that they are just waiting to figure out a way to privatize that public housing and turn it into these condominiums. Because they're, they're locating, when you think about it, you know, some places in Coney Island and other, right on the shore, you have this beach line. You know, now you have all of this public housing right there with where are these people going to work? You know, how far are they going to travel to get to Long Island City, as awkward as it is to get there sometimes? And now we're going to see, you know, they're eyeing this public housing and people are concerned. Are they letting it go down so far so that people will give them up, walk away, and they can turn it into private housing? Because it is located in very, you know, now located in very nice areas, whereas before they were shunted off. Which is a, a function region. of the gentrification yeah, the that's gentrification. going on around the city. And so now you're seeing like million dollar um, apartment buildings right next to public housing buildings. And, you know, and they're eyeing these buildings like this is really great if we could just get this other building. So how far are they going to let public housing go in order to have people decide we're going to give it up or we're just going to live like in these horrible. So the way we ways. solve these kind of problems is through the political process, isn't it? And my uh, Senator Gennaris, who represents that area, you can see the dynamic already about maybe some of the things you're talking about have to be settled through those elected officials. And we get back to guess what? The legislature, and it's we uh, the challenge that you raised a minute ago is what will the state senate do and what will the assembly do? We're going to see, because we can't just sit here and argue about it or just go out in the streets. That won't help. The place to solve this problem is up there in the state legislature. Well, oh. I think it's important to argue about it, and I believe in protest, so I believe in going out in the streets. Well, we and have I, done that. But, yes, but, but it has to continue. But here's the thing. I believe in legislation, litigation, and protest, working together as this triage that will actually have a vision of what they want changed. And I think people in public housing in particular, under what this, so many different legis um, um, legislative groups 
race, whether or not it's Republican and Democrat, have always been uh, the, the people who um, end up under the bus. And so there has to be some type of pushback. I, I believe that it should register to vote. I believe all these things should happen. But I'm seeing so little progress in the last 20, 30 years when it comes to public housing. Well, but I, uh, we're getting back to the process question of what in the world has been going on up in Albany since 2010? What the hell is I, I, going I on? It, I think it's bigger than an, um, uh, an Albany story. I think one of the great lessons about Amazon here takes us into the larger political environment on a federal level and the lack of regulation and the idea that something could become such a, you know, a monster organization like Amazon, which can sell you anything from a computer to a bag of grapes. I mean, they really, it's an enormous organization. And the fact that they're the senior and in, partner. And in, and in the process damaging local yeah, retail, which is they, the heart of yeah, the city. And they, they are the senior partner here we're doing it on their terms, as you said. This is this is New York State. This is not you know. This That's is, the question. This is the great state That's of the, the, question. Of the Did country. Did they want to come here anyway? The most wealthy state in the country, uh, and Amazon is calling the shots here. This, and I mean, there's, there's a larger lesson you know, here about the, the role of federal are they government. The shots. Let me be a little devil's advocate here. Are they calling the shots? If the vast majority of benefits that they are getting or as of right for any company moving jobs either into the city or from Manhattan to an outer borough. I'm a Brooklyn guy, pardon me saying outer <laughs> borough. From Manhattan to another borough. Um, you, know, you know, that's why I think the rollout of this is so grotesque. Well, first of all, so most of it is as of right that any company could Not have gotten. And they don't get but the benefit a, until they create yes, the jobs. But there's a significant $500 million yes. capital grant, I don't know, why that had to be agreed to, that the optics on that are terrible. And the, the other question also is, is pretty bad. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But especially when the subway yeah, system is crumbling and the buses don't move. Go but the other thing is this. If they were smarter about it, they would have said, we can take these tax incentives and we're going to, and here's how we're going to use it in the right. community. They didn't do that. That could have been influenced by the politicians working with Amazon to say, you know, let's use these programs. And they could even set a percentage of it. They could even have kept some, not that they need the, the money. But the, the, the public housing benefits that are baked into this memorandum of understanding are so limited. I mean, that's, that's the other thing. If they had come out and said, this is, we're going to have a robust program for ensuring hiring and outreach in, the pu in public housing nearby, but they have a minuscule amount of that that's happening. Now, legally, I don't think they could require hiring but they could have baked a lot more in. Yeah, I mean, there's also, I mean, I want to I want to touch on Washington, but you also have, if they're talking about high-tech jobs. How are you going to prepare kids for high-tech jobs if they don't get algebra in seventh grade? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of this comes back to uh, preparing kids properly for a, for a technology-based, STEM-based, econo you know, economy to come. And I, you know, I think our school system let's just say, does not do a very good job on It that. does not do a very good job for certain people. <laughs> you know, it does an excellent job for other people. And so then this whole issue then becomes, oh, it's time for me to stop. This whole <laughs> issue then becomes one in which we have to say, um, a school system that's not going to be able to afford to educate our children properly, and we have this influx of money how can we use this money to educate our children properly, especially these particular children located right here when they're saying the jobs are $100,000 a year jobs? Now, we know that if they don't have an education, they're not going to be not getting this 100 jobs. Yeah, they're not yeah. getting those jobs. And so there's like this carrot of, yeah, go ahead and sign. And so when you have the community people saying, yes, you know, we're, we, we agree that Amazon should be here, they are thinking, as you point out before, oh, you know, 25,000 jobs paying $100,000 a year. That could be me. When they knew when they pinned this agreement, it wasn't going to be those well, people living in public housing. You're going to have house. a lot of young professionals moving to New York. It's going to flood the real estate market more. Uh, it's going to provide more incentives for upper level real estate. Uh, and it's going to uh, feed what we call gentrification in New York and the displacement of people who are already being priced out of the city. That's, 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 a, that's a factor that none of the people who are the architects well, of this plan seem me, to um, consider. Let me take a look at Washington briefly because I don't want to... And I want to set aside Jerry Nadler potentially 
holding hearings that could lead to the impeachment of the president. Let's set, you know, let's set the... <laughs> Let's set that you know, aside. As, as delicious as... That's, that's as, genuine. Let's talk about the impeachment. Oh, as, as delicious as Trump's problems may be, <laughs> to, you, know, to, you know, those of us from New York City, um, what difference does it make to New York that Nita Lowy is going to run appropriations, that uh, Nidia Velasquez is going to run the, you know, the small business committee? And, you know, you know to some degree, they'll be, they're in a position to stop some of the worst things that have been that have been coming down. It goes like, back to what the same question. Well, who do you want to be, Democrats? I mean, Nancy Pelosi has been, you know, I mean, if you look at federal policy over the last 20 years, the Democrats and the Republicans have very much cooperated with decent, de deregulation, with a tax policy that give, makes us, the disparity in wealth in this country is the worst in the world. That's not an no, accident. No, no, the worst in the developed world. In the developed world. No, let's Pardon me. be very okay. careful. Okay, about, okay. I don't want to uh, yeah, right. overstate it. All right. But that's bad enough, isn't it? Um, well, and, yes, um, but, but we're trying to yeah, be very precise. Okay, here, okay. you're right. Particularly you're right. in an educational you're right. institution. Yes, you're right. When I write this up, I, All right. I, that's okay. what I do say. But right. anyway. Let her edit you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I, I always, will. I, I used to be a newspaper person. I'd be happy to edit you. But, um, I. And, and it's, it's a function of policy. It's not an accident. And Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats have been part of it. So the question is, who do they want to be? Do they really want to be progressives or do they just want to say they're progressives? They're progressives on certain things, you know. There's um, a pretty good chance in this atmosphere, the way the energy is in the Democratic Party, that they're going to do some things that, that address what the base is, is pushing for. But once you have those gavels and... The first thing it's going to do is improve the campaign coffers of those elected officials that we know, right? People are going to be trying to influence their behavior, so we have to see how, how that works out. And One of the things we found, when, when, I, when this Amazon deal was struck, one of the first things we did was look at where Amazon has given campaign donations. Mm. And they had almost no footprint in New York except for members of Congress, where a lot of these regulations happen and where there's potential talk about, you know, breaking them up as unlikely as that might be. You can't do, yeah, and you can't do much with one House of Congress and a crazy president. So, I mean, you can well, stop Well, you can. The, you, you can, can stop, stop stuff. Things, right. But you can't, it's, you can't implement change. You can't you can say, set a direction. this is our you policy can... agenda and we're going we're to implement it. You can't do it just with the House of Representatives. But you can show even, your policy. Even on the best of certain, as you said, there's a good chance. But, and which could also be reflected in Senate but, elections, but, where the Democrats um, have, a, have a, you know, advantageous map in 2020. I, yeah, I am... You can't do it one house. I mean, it. it I, so I, it, we like to think that maybe what happened this year is is a is a is a predictor of what will happen in 2020. But not between now and 2020, um, you're not going to see much policy come out of Washington that's going to be satisfying. Uh, you'll see. Uh, more effective constraints on the president. You might see infrastructure. You might see an infrastructure deal is the one thing which, well, which is well, not unimportant. Well, no, it's not unimportant. Here's, a, here's a, the overarching question for me. People go to Congress representing their district. So then if they can't get anything done nationally, what are they doing in their districts? That's when a real politician's, you know... What do they acumen, bring home? Yeah, what do they bring home? That's when the acumen comes out. What are, what are you able to do? The, the politicians that really made their names in history were the ones, no matter who was running what, nationally, they knew how to bring home what was needed in their districts. And so that goes back to the question of asking politicians what it is that you want in your community. And then following it up and saying, did you get this for us? And if not, why not? What the House, the Democratic House does and what happens in Congress and between Congress and the president is going to have a lot of influence on 2019 into 2020. Mm -hmm. If the Democratic House is really progressive and aggressive and setting that agenda, even if it has no chance in the Senate, that's going to influence the debate. It's going to influence the presidential election and the next round of congressional elections. If there's some sort of uh, infrastructure bill and bipartisanship and Trump does something to boost himself, you know, with some of the independents, that will have a big effect. So, so there's dynamics that are going to play out that are going to have a significant impact on the next two years. Yes, ma'am. Tell us, tell us your name and tell us the campus you're from. 
Hi, I'm Victoria Fix. Um, I go to John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Oh, we have a there you we, go. We, we have, have a, a, we have a John Jay <laughs> um, I just would like to know: Do you think that with this new election and these new poli newly elected politicians, do you think they're going to start prioritizing CUNY students and our needs because? It seems like with these investments in Amazon, with the new changes to our city, our students are often go to class hungry or we can't get to class because of the subway and we're being put on the back burner. It, Great question. Uh, I mean, uh, Great uh, question uh, from a John Jay student. And especially <laughs> because those Amazon jobs are going to depend on the quality. Who gets those Amazon mm -hmm. jobs is going to be very much linked to the quality of the education that those students get. Well, so John Jay, uh, John Jay student, you want to jump in? <laughs> well, first let's just put it this way. We're right now, the professors are, are in battle trying to get contracts, trying to, you know, get pay raises. And then, of course, um, for the students, we're looking at a, a student population that's beginning to decline because as the economy, in, in, you know, goes up, then sometimes the college is something that becomes a second resort. And, and so it's not the first, it's not the last, but it's somewhere in the middle and, and students have other opportunities. And so you have these very expensive public, um, private schools, but you also have this, this public school, CUNY, that requires public support. And sometimes we forget that this is a public school. This is New York's public school. And that we should be looking at CUNY and, and realizing the Pulitzer Prize winners and all the major Well, it's awards. an investment in yes, the Yes, an investment in the, in the city. But I'm always concerned that people look at other schools, like NYU Columbia, and I have nothing against those schools at all, and they think the smart kids go there and the other kids who can't get into those other schools or have these other circumstances go to CUNY and not understand that, that, that CUNY is a, is a gift, it's a diamond, and that it's, it's given such short shrift sometimes among New Yorkers that we need to understand what CUNY has to offer so that when there are attacks to, to undercut the funding for, for CUNY students, that all New Yorkers should be speaking up. Because there's, you know, this really with CUNY is, is two degrees of separation between yourself and somebody in your family who went to a CUNY college. Brooklyn yeah. College. I mean, there, there's, there's <laughs> been Hunter, a, Hunter College. There, there's been a, a, a pathetic divestment in public higher education across the country, and New York State is no exception to that. And so we, there we have more students. We don't have more money. Um, it, CUNY's really struggling financially. I can tell you, as, as from the campus point of view. Um, you know, now there's, they're struggling over another contract. Uh, it's unfortunate that CUNY is not seen as the resource it should be seen as. Yeah. I mean, we are the American dream. We I, are the American dream machine. I, yeah. come, I, mean, I come out of another place. I came to New York. I married a man from the Bronx. I am a New Yorker. Good move. But I came from another place. <laughs> Better and in Brooklyn, I but Bronx is I disagree with you about the perception of CUNY. And Bronx High School of Science and Stuyvesant and the, the great tradition that was not something... I went to a public school. I come from Utah, okay? I went to a little school. Eight, I had 29 students. I went to the... Uh, in my class, I went to the University of Colorado, and then I ended up here for graduate school. And I married the man from the Bronx, and I stayed. And the thing that just astounded me was this great, wonderful... CUNY system, City College, and all the people that I have met over the years. And I have spent the last 40 years of my life mainly in politics. And to your question, I have been talking to students for four, five, six years about the student debt. And if you notice, student debt is now, talking about policy, has become a hot issue. When, when we, it's, it's right up there with climate change now. There are a couple issues that, that if uh, I, was, I was the policy person 20 years ago who used to write up the list for the candidates. These are the things you've got to take a look at. And student debt and, what, and public education upper, is something that is now at the top. Real don't you quick, agree, Real quick, ben? I, I do think that's the case nationally. I don't know in New York what Governor Cuomo and well, the legislature what, are going to prioritize on that. This is what we're going to see, and uh, maybe yes, you should sir, go to Albany. Your, tell us your name and your <laughs> campus, please. My name is Sion Samuel, and I'm from Brooklyn College. Uh, my question, Excellent school. <laughs> my question, um, in the intro, you mentioned about five Democrats with a possible presidential um, campaign run. Um, the last two, the mayor and the governor. Do you think that their deals with Amazon were more so 
geared towards their benefits towards the presidential campaign runs or towards the city? What, I mean, if you're talking about, you're asking about the motive, what we think the motivation for the, for the Amazon deal is. I mean, I, you know, I think that there's a, there's a little bit of, I've seen my, the old George Washington Plunkett, I've seen my opportunities and I took them. I don't, I, I mean, I'll just say that I don't think Mayor de Blasio is running for president. I, I just think that's totally either. zero chance of that, in my opinion. Mm, or point, I agree. Point zero zero one. Mm, yeah. Governor Cuomo, I think as much as he said, I'm not doing it, I think his ears and eyes are still open to it. We put that maybe as a small chance. And the Amazon deal is another one of his type of to him, big achievements. His infrastructure program, some of the legacy achievements legislatively. It's abs it's part of part of the stuff that he knows, like having his father's name put on a bridge, you know, is the type of stuff that he'll be potentially remembered well, for. Well he did long. orchestrate the building of that bridge. Yes. I mean, and, and he just put his father's <laughs> name on it. On so the, on so the old I think for him it's the type of thing he thinks would bolster that resume. The can-do resume. Yes. yes. And, and he, may, he may take another look at it in a few months, I think, once, if things go the way that they probably will, the Democrats in Albany have a pretty successful first three months until the budget's due. I think the governor starts to maybe think about it a little bit. I think you could also argue that the progressive pressure, if, you know, if, if the governor is thinking about running for president, he wants to look as a great progressive. And the progressives, especially the new lawmakers who were recently elected, can try to exploit that desire on the part of the, on the, you know, on the part of the governor. You can play his, you can play oh, that's his happen. to your own there. benefit. There's absolutely a possibility for that. That's definitely happening. But he's already, you know, part of his quote unquote genius is he sees that coming and he's going to own it. So it's going to be his... He may object to putting the quotes around <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> but, uh, but, but he sees that coming. He already knew that. He saw that happening in the campaign. He's moved leftward over, over time, even though he says he's the same pragmatic progressive that, you know, he's always been. That, that's what he, you know, he's definitely moved, and the legislature is going to push him. He likes physical monuments. He's got two bridges sure. now. He, you know, he's got Amazon. He li he's very impressed with that. But speaking of his monuments, too... But he doesn't back have the MTA. Well, they, okay. they're underneath, they're under right. the ground. But going back to the first question, <laughs> yes. he thinks his Excelsior scholarship, mm -hmm. which is not a CUNY, you know, which is not really aimed at the types of uh, students that struggle, uh, you know, in a very hard way to really pay the bills and eat and, and things like that. You know, it's a, he, he built it. It's, a, it's for the middle class. It is he middle. thinks that, yeah, that's exactly what it is. He thinks that's a big legacy item, but there is a lot of noise coming back at him that's saying, you need to do more for others who want to attend college tuition free. Yes, ma'am. Tell us your name and your campus, please. I'm Erin McDermott from Hunter College. Uh, uh, and and see, we're, we're, all, <laughs> we're all well represented here. <laughs> um, I know that there are several developed countries who turn to third parties to take care of redistricting. I was wondering if coming up, uh, since we have the new democratically uh, majority uh, in the state legislature, if that could be an option, uh, how could it happen and would you fight for it? You know, I think that raises a very interesting question about this last year, the Working Families Party, which seemed to be coming into its own with de Blasio being elected mayor and how much of a beating, beating it took. I mean, that is the third party in New York, isn't it? I and mean, it used to be the conservative party. Yeah, well, let's, not let's, anymore, let's, though. Well, but I'm just but, saying but, but that I, question. But I'm talking about this election. This all election, right, all right, but, uh, the Working Families Party took a real beating by supporting, you know, a gubernatorial candidate that doesn't, didn't do well at all. Um, they, but you've also seen the foibles of... You know, Cuomo essentially forcing the Working Families Party to come to him in order and agreeing, deigning to accept the and, nomination, and, has focused on the whole question of the, fusion voting. Why, the party what, the you know, party. why shouldn't the Working Families Party nominate its own candidates? I'm, I happen to be against the, the whole concept of fusion. I'm with you. You want to run, you run. But um, you know, the party, it's, uh, it, it, it. It, to me, it lost its opportunities there. And it, one, one of the things that was very damaging to it, I think, in terms of, if you look at the history of it, which I wrote about in the book, actually, mm -hmm. um, it was very much dependent on labor support and labor yes. union split on this. I mean, it was very, I think it was a very damaging, it was a very damaging election for the Working Families Party in many ways, particularly 
losing organ, some, well, it, of, some it, of the key it, unions. It, because it, it exposed, I don't mean this critically, because this, is, cause this applies to every party, so this is not picking on them. You know, the, it exposed essentially their, tran their transactional nature, that they were a creature between activist movements, make the road, the kind of street-level, right. progressive, populist, lefty movements, and labor unions, which are transactional in a different way. And it was, in some ways, an unholy marriage that was always waiting to blow up. Well, I, I, I somewhat disagree with Joe in that the Working Families Party was instrumental in a lot of these state senate primary That's wins over these independent no, Democratic conference members that really buoyed them. And they also had an existential question at the did beginning. Did they, and, and I don't know the answers, mm -hmm. did, did they provide the winning margin in some of those races? Oh, I, 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 I don't think I, we can tell. I mean, right, you know, okay. there were a lot right. of there were a lot of groups and a lot of factors. And I mean, you had a, you had elected officials like Scott Stringer and Corey Johnson backing these challengers. I mean, you know, th this was a big split in the Democratic Party, obviously. Um, but so the Working Families Party is still questionable about whether it can really survive without those labor unions. But there's also a question about whether they maybe come back. Maybe it's after a couple more years and, you know, the governor is over it or, you know, something like that. So I, I don't know, but I, I do want to go back to the question real quick, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. And, and that is, I think that was, the question was getting more at um, sort of an independent body. That's doing what, I, that's yes. what yes. I wanted to yes. say, yes. So, yes. so <laughs> and, and that is what the 2014 constitutional amendment that voters passed in New York actually sets up somewhat of a system to do redistricting in an independent way. But the legislature, of course, still gets to weigh in on it. So, we'll and, see. and that's that's my point. That's what the way I heard the question, um, because the U.S. Supreme Court has had a, a few cases before it in which um, it had to decide whether or not once they have this independent body determine the, the districts and can now the, the losing um, party that didn't get the, the um, districts it wanted or the power it wanted then sue that independent body and say that they have no right to have the districts that were um, were um, created. Um, I, I want to also go back to packing when you were talking about the mm -hmm. district packing yes. and that is not just African Americans but other groups you know have had their districts packed and what district packing, packing means is that if you know you're going to lose that district anyway say this is a district of, of, of Democrats. So you pack all the Democrats into that district. You draw the lines to extend to include any Democrats outside in the other districts all in this one because you're going to lose it anyway. And so that way there are no Democrats in the other districts on the sides of those of other, other districts that could then be um, in a contest against, say, the conservative or Republican in that district that, that it borders it. And so the, there was a, a U.S. Supreme Court case in which um, African American politicians in Alabama challenged packing. So there's not all the African-American yes. politicians agree with packing. Some don't, some do. Um, but the idea that when it's done to the group, there's the problem. The issue becomes whether or not the districting is created based on racial lines, which is unconstitutional, or based on political lines, which is not. Well, there are, there are challenges to whether partisan advantage is yes. illegal as a redistricting motive. I'm, I'm not familiar with what the final outcome of those cases. The final outcome is the Supreme Court sent it back down and yes. said it doesn't right, want, right, want to be right. involved exactly. in, in determining these partisan um, districting lines. But the problem is, since certain groups like African Americans do vote Democratic because the Democratic Party is offering the issues of concern to them, then that means that if by d designing those lines that cut through places where a lot of African Americans live, does that mean they're doing something that's race-based or is politics-based? New York has very badly gerrymandered lines, and you got at this earlier. The Assembly has this huge majority, and the Senate Republicans were able to have a slim majority, even though they're so outnumbered in New York. And that was a deal from the last redistricting that Governor Cuomo helped strike. Uh, <laughs> and so we now have those districts to reckon with after the next census. And obviously there's all sorts of questions about how that census is going to play out. Whether in there's an immigration but question. We could cetera, very cetera. well see some drastically different districts designed so that they're not these crazy shapes that were made to protect a Republican state Senate and a Democratic assembly. But it's, I think it's Arizona, you may, you may know, that has an independent commission. Yes. And I think California did that too. And because I'm a Westerner at heart, the Westerners have developed this. Rather than have the politicians draw the lines, there is an independent commission in Arizona that draws the lines. And the basis of them is not uh, gender or all these other, it's based on community. 
you draw them so they're neighborhoods because the idea is that a neighborhood has a certain uh, attitude of things that they want and it works pretty well there have been challenges to it and I defer to you on on the stuff there but I don't know why we well, couldn't that's what's have in New York we couldn't have an independent commission uh, and who chooses that's the That's what's members. supposed to happen in New well, York. Well, generally what happens is you have three or four that are selected by the majority and the minority uh, parties in the Senate and the majority and the minority representatives from the Assembly and then uh, the governor gets some. There is a commission called the Commission on Judicial Nomination that we have in New York State that is made up just exactly that way. And what do they do? Those people on that commission select a certain number of people that are then sent to the governor and the governor gets to appoint who gets to be on our state court of appeals and the state court of appeals is equivalent to the US Supreme Court only it's the New York State Court of Appeals so there are ways to do this that would be much fairer the question is are you and we, we have less than a minute left oh, the dear. question is do you <laughs> you know the old this is the age-old question is how do you take politics out of the most political of decisions you don't take politics Can't. out but you you put structures in place that give every a, a bunch of people, in the way I just described it, a chance to work together to come up, we hope, with something that's good for, in this case, the state of New York. And these are the big tests for the Democrats in New York yeah. now, is how much are they going to do things that are the right way versus how much are they now, in this significant seat of power, going to do things that, for generations and generations, secure their own power and redistricting is a top example. There will always be politics. And the and of course the question is whether the governor, you know, ruling over the state really wants to see all these progressive things happen. I'm getting the goodbye sign. I always make deadline. Thank you all. We'll see you next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.